Daniel Viegas uh, will possibly be freed soon um, after he was wrongfully convicted or possibly wrongfully convicted in uh, the deaths of Ronald England and Armando Lazo in 1995. Now he was 16 years old at the time and there was a drive-by shooting that resulted in the death of these two men. And at the time, uh, police officers accused him and according to uh, what Viegas says now, they forced him to write a confession that had information that was inconsistent with some of the evidence involved in the crime. So according to the Los Angeles Times, Viegas' conviction was based almost entirely on his one-page dictated confession, which did not match the facts of the case in numerous ways. For example, Viegas claimed that he was riding that night in a car driven by a man who was in prison at the time. Viegas said the car was white, it was red. So that's just one example, or two examples, I should say, of some of the inconsistencies in that confession. Now, I should note, he has not been exonerated. There's no DNA evidence or no clear-cut evidence here proving that he is innocent. However, uh, his defense attorney is asking that they at least grant him bond, and they uh, call for a retrial. So we'll see if that happens. A judge still hasn't made the decision about it. But he is expect expected to be free. He is expected to be freed. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's an amazing case. Now, look, th there's injustice uh, in the country. It happens, right? And it's our job to point it out, and, and, and every time it, it feels like, oh, my God, I can't believe this happened. But we understand mistakes are made. But to me, the more interesting part of the story is that, you know, when you see hear confession, a jury often feels like, well, that's it. The guy confessed. There's, what else is there, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to understand how easy it is to either coerce a confession or to lead a witness into a confession. Absolutely, especially if you're a teenager, right? right? Because if you're a teenager and you've been accused of this type of crime and you have not actually committed that crime, oftentimes during the interrogation, you know, the officials will tell you things like, if you don't confess, you know, we're gonna send you to prison right away. And you're, in, in this case, they talked about how, you know, the police officer said that he was gonna get beaten to death and this and that, and he was scared. He's a 16 year old, you right. know? So uh, he's like, okay, fine, let me just write this confession because maybe then I'll get to go home. They're under the impression that that's going to happen. And since they're young, they get broken down very easily. And they don't understand the consequences that you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. Exactly. You know, I, I know even with my three-year-old, I try not to lead the witness. Because if you do, the kid will tell you whatever you want. Right? Right. Like, hey, did you fight a dragon today? Well, yeah, I did, Baba. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. So, so, and the thing is, cops have to be especially careful about this. Unfortunately, that's the second lesson to be learned here, which is that oftentimes the cops just want to close the case and the prosecutors want to get their conviction. They know that the car was red, that it wasn't white. Yep. They know that the description didn't match. Here's right? some more. They know the guy was in jail, the guy that he said drove the car, right? Yeah. But they go along with it anyway because the most important thing is I want to look good and I want to get a, that check next to my name. Uh, for my boss. Right, you want to close the case. And, and you know, the, the Los Angeles Times did an excellent job in mentioning other uh, pieces of evidence or other issues within the original trial that led to this 16-year-old's conviction. For, inst uh, for instance, an appellate court found recently that Viegas did not have adequate counsel during the trial. Among the witnesses not called in his defense was a young woman who was prepared to testify that Viegas was babysitting at the time of the shooting, according to court documents. I mean, that's kind of a that's kind of a big deal. That's kind how of a big you, deal. I don't understand how some people graduated from law school or graduated from life. Like, <laughs> if you're a defense lawyer, you don't call the witness that's his alibi that knew that he was babysitting? Like, how bad do you have to be? I, I just, I literally can't imagine it. Yeah. Like, how, isn't that the first question you ask? Hey, Viegas, where were you that night? Oh, I was babysitting. And there's the witness. What? So yes, this would be inadequate defense counsel. Right. So I the am definition of it. I am hoping for a retrial, um, and then we'll see what happens after that. But just to give you guys some specific numbers on the number of exonerations and um, how many of those exonerations originally had confessions that were completely false and coerced, there were about 1,284 exonerations nationwide since 1989. 158 of them involved false confessions. So it happens often. That's a big number, man. Mm -hmm. So next time you hear about a confession, keep that in mind. Look, most of the time the confession is real, right? And give that its uh, weight, as you should. But keep in mind, oftentimes things like this happen, and, and they're coerced in different ways.